and welcome back to the Film School for Marketers podcast. My name is Mariah Anderson. I am one of your co-hosts and we have Zach Basner, our other co-host. You know this guy, Zach. We haven't done a podcast together in a while, I feel like. So we're we'll bringing back the, uh, the OGs <laughs> with Steph. Back Steph. So we've had Stephanie on before. She is our director of community and events here at Impact. And uh, we're super thrilled to have her because she is just a wealth of knowledge. Um, but specifically, there's a lot of talk around virtual events right now and how companies can do it and really shift from these in-person conferences to more of a virtual route and just in general what companies can do um, to reach out to more people and, and engage with their audience a bit more. So Stephanie was able to take our in-person event and turn it into a virtual event very quickly <laughs> and very successfully, if I might add. So we wanted to have her on just to talk a little bit more about what she experienced uh, when putting it together, just tips and things uh, that would be helpful for you and questions that she's gotten along the way and that occurred even after our digital sales and marketing day, which is the virtual event that we had, what, two weeks ago at this point? Yeah, it was like two and a half weeks ago now. <laughs> this is crazy. So crazy. So Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for us. having me back, guys. For sure. Um, so my first question is, what were the first few decisions you had to make in order to plan this virtual event that we did? Yeah, I love starting with this because I think when people have come to me with questions about their virtual event or whether or not they're going to do one, they immediately jump to questions like, what platform should we use? Or how long should the event be? <laughs> should it be live? And the really the first question you have to answer and the absolute first thing we thought about was, what does our audience need right now? If we're going to do an event, we absolutely cannot be successful with it, even with the best platform in the world, the best speakers in the world, if we are not catering it to our audience. So in our unique situation, we were pivoting from this planned in-person event to hosting an in a virtual event on the same scheduled day. And it was going to serve a few purposes. We had a lot of content and knowledge to share that we had learned in the past six months that we had a variety of speakers who were preparing presentations and they wanted to teach everyone what they'd learned, and we knew that our audience wanted to get these updates. So sharing that updated information and knowledge that we had was a big part of it. We also knew that our audience and our community, which is part of why community is part of my title, loves getting the chance to come together and to connect and to learn from each other, but also to just chat in the hallway and just be part of each other's lives and careers in this unique way. And if we took that away completely, we would all have a big hole in our hearts on April 6th, which was the planned date. So when we could have said, well, maybe it's not best to do our event on a Monday, we thought about what our audience would want and we knew we had to keep it on the day that the original event was planned for that reason. And then we talked about, well, how long should it be? We had already had people's full days marked out for this event because they were going to be there in person. So let's give them a full day worth of knowledge and, and event and hopefully entertainment. Um, on that same day. And so a lot of our decisions maybe weren't based on industry best practices or event best practices, but they were really specifically based on what our audience needed. And that drove a lot of our decisions. Steph, one thing that I have been dealing with is talking with people about their virtual events, but really what they're describing to me is a webinar. <laughs> so like to, to you, like what's the distinction between well, first of all, is a webinar considered a virtual event? Uh, but what what's the distinction between what we did with Digital Sales and Marketing Day and what is normally just like a webinar that we would do? Yeah, you're the second person to ask me that today. A webinar is not a virtual event for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, an event is something that is longer than 90 minutes. And that is just like my, maybe my personal definition. It's something I've gathered from the industry. But just in the way that you wouldn't call a marketing meetup, after hours at a bar, uh, a conference, you would call it a meetup or an event. Um, you wouldn't call a webinar a virtual event. There's more substance to it than that. And to anyone who tries to pass off like a 45 minute webinar as a virtual event, that's worse than just doing a webinar. I'm also on like a, I feel like I'm now the webinar vigilante. I'm on a mission to just have no more webinars ever again. <laughs> if I could live in a world with no webinars, I would be happy. So I think that if everyone who's doing a webinar approaches it, maybe that's something that's really common in your industry or that your legacy teams are not on board with letting go of yet, um, until you can get them to understand the value of more unique and 
engaging virtual events. If you treat your webinar with the same care and attention and approach that you would a virtual event, it is going to be better. And what was different about our virtual event from just a webinar for Digital Sales and Marketing Day, we had a variety of live and pre-recorded on-demand sessions. Some of them were 30 minutes, some of them were 60 minutes. They happened at the same time throughout the day. The biggest difference was that we knew this was not about us presenting a 45 minute slide deck and taking questions at the end. That just absolutely could not be the format. And we knew that we were replacing what was an in-person event. And even though not every virtual event is gonna do that, it should accomplish a lot of the same things. For some industries, it's about getting people to connect with each other. And we knew that we had to offer chat alongside of our webinar. There's usually a Q&A alongside of the webinar. People can pop questions in or maybe ask questions in the chat. But the questions are usually like, what was that tool you mentioned? Or are these going to be recorded? And we knew that as part of this event, having our community in here and letting them talk with each other was the next best thing to letting them actually sit next to each other in person. And so we created chat alongside our uh, live streamed and pre-recorded sessions. And most importantly, for any session that was pre-recorded, we didn't want to make anybody feel tricked. I think the only thing worse than a pre-recorded webinar <laughs> is a pre-recorded session passed off as a live one. So we said, join us for these live sessions, and then these on-demand ones would be available at a certain time. For each of those, we invited, and in some cases required, the presenters, the speakers, to join in the chat live that day. So even though they were pre-recorded, uh, sessions. The speakers were there chatting live, keeping the conversation going, answering the questions more than they probably would have been able to if they had been actually presenting it live. And we got a lot of positive feedback on that. The Really the overall takeaway though is that we gave people ways to engage. We added polls, we added uh, video examples so we tried to beef it up as much as possible and really push the boundaries of what a typical pre-recorded session or webinar might be like. And I think we really only hit the, like scratch the surface. There's so much more there that we're going to do. And I know that people loved the fact that during the pre-recorded sessions that they were able to have discussions with the person who is actually giving that session, um, which kind of leads into my question you started to touch upon, which twofold, you know, why did we choose to go with mostly pre-recorded sessions versus live? And did you see any difference in terms of the experience that people had in the ones that were pre-recorded versus the live ones that we did? Yeah. So being that it was truly our first full virtual event, I mean, we had done webinars in the past. We've done a couple of other things, but this was our first actual full day virtual event. And there's just so much that can go wrong technically, especially when you're talking about live I mean, when you're streaming content in general, but specifically live, you're relying on the internet and the internet has never been more stressed than when we're all at home working off our home Wi-Fi, and we have, I mean, we had 3000 people registered for this event. We knew that we could easily have over a thousand people tuning in live. We did. And for every session that we added, we added an element of something that could go wrong. And then adding that live aspect was even more risky. And so we figured that the best way for us to deliver a really great experience to our attendees was to record the content ahead of time. We set standards for it. We wanted to make sure that it was brand new content. We weren't digging up old talks from on stage in previous years that we were going to replay, which I've seen some events doing. We weren't taking old webinars and just rebroadcasting them. This was all recorded specifically for this event. And we had people say that in their sessions in some cases. Uh, but we just tried to avoid as many technical issues as possible. And believe me, even with that, we still had our share of technical challenges, which found to happen. Uh, that did help us, knowing that we wanted to do that, did help us choose our platform. And so we chose Big Marker. And we're pretty happy with it. Um, for the budget, obviously, we had a budget we needed to stay within. And especially right now, knowing that we were refunding tickets to Digital Sales and Marketing World, which our in-person event is rescheduled tentatively for December. But we knew that there were people who needed that money back right now. And so uh, we wanted to keep the spend on the tool relatively low. There's great tools out there that can do amazing things for $25,000 to forty to $70,000 we didn't have that money to spend right now. And so we found Big Marker. Um, they're a great tool that they have different levels 
of functionality, we took into consideration the fact that we wanted to live stream. We wanted to uh, have those pre-recorded sessions happening at certain times and only unlocked at that time and have multiple sessions running at once. We wanted to have chat. Uh, we did not want people to have to sign into different URLs or webinars to join each new live session. If there's a session at 10.30, 11, 11.30, and 12, you didn't need four separate links. You had one link, and then you had buttons that said enter to enter the different sessions. So that was really important to us. And the final thing that helped us decide our, on our tool was the uh, data that we needed to get out of it. So for our partnerships and our sponsors of our event, one thing that's really important to them was finding out who attended their specific sessions. So not just everyone, but actually segmenting it to who attended the session about what they did and was in, were interested in their topic. And so we needed a platform that was going to be able to show us that, who attended which sessions, um, who actually used their link to sign in day of. So we took the data we needed, the experience we wanted to provide, and the technical considerations, and we found Big Marker. I'm not sure how many event marketers listen to this podcast or watch this. I mean, I think for a lot of our listeners, it's like it's a part of their job as a marketer, as a videographer, to participate in these things. And they might hear what you're saying here, Steph, because you know a lot about this. They might go, well, yeah, it would be great. We could do this if we had somebody like Steph, who's like, is a specialist in virtual events, but you weren't always a specialist in virtual events. Like how, how did you get to where we were just like a few months ago playing this big in-person event to being able to execute something like this? Like what, what could somebody take away as this is what I need to do to be able to pull off a great virtual event for my company? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was not a virtual event specialist. I had done a couple of virtual events and definitely live streamed AMAs and webinars and things. Uh, but I think planning a virtual event was relatively easy for me because it's a convergence of a lot of the things I'm passionate about, which is community, putting on a show and the technical considerations around data and getting things to work well. And so if you can either find someone or assemble a team of people who want to put on a great show and teach and share great content, create a community of people who want to come together to learn and then have someone who's really going to run the technical side of it, even if that's three people, you can nail it. Um, in addition to that, event professionals, I don't know. I, this has been so interesting to me. I don't know if this is true of every industry, but event professionals love to share their knowledge. I mean, we have created communities, Slack teams, Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups, just to be like, here's exactly what I did. Here's how many ticket sales we had. Here's how much revenue we made. I mean, we share everything. And so we, on March 12th, we made the decision to pivot to the virtual event and postpone our event. So we had just under four weeks to put on this virtual event. And within like three days, the event community that I'm in had come together because we were all doing the same thing to create a spreadsheet, a massive spreadsheet with multiple tabs of all the tools we had evaluated, the pros and cons, the top 10 questions you need to answer, how long everyone was making their event, um, how much promo time they were doing, what they were doing to promote it, what speakers they had. Like People were dumping information into this document. And uh, Vidyard put up a great article, like I think March 15th, like right around that same time, of everything you need to do before, during, and after a virtual event because they had done fast forward as their virtual event. So they knew it. So everyone was really, really willing to throw this information out there. It can be a lot. It can be overwhelming. But I think to anyone who's thinking about doing it, just do a little research, like spend one day and you will be shocked at how much you find. And then figure out what you need to learn and, and make those decisions. Don't get overwhelmed by trying to become a virtual event expert. You just have to get the information you need to do what you need to do. So for a, a large part of our event, it was pre-recorded material. So we've talked about that. But Steph, I think the videographers that are listening might be curious as to how that was pre-recorded. Like yes. what kind of softwares did people use? How did they execute that? What was the, the good parts and the bad parts of those pre-recordings? Boy, did we learn a lot with that one. Uh we knew that we had some great internal people like the two of you who have, and you know, Will, who had done courses for uh, Impact Plus for our online education community and had the setup, had the camera, the audio, the lighting to do it correctly. Uh, we really underestimated uh, what everyone else would know to do inherently. And I think next time we are going to benefit a lot from providing not just standards, which is kind of what we did this time, but guidance. 
And so um, someone on our team, Jess Palmieri, I have a screenshot. She did such a great job. I think Mariah used it. I can drop it. it in show notes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she like balanced a light on a book in the corner of her room and then stood in front of it with her laptop on a chair or something. And like she made it work. Um, but the standards that we gave people were things like don't make it a sales pitch. Um, we should have said don't use a virtual background. And <laughs> we didn't say that. And we had a couple that were didn't get great feedback. Um, then we had people come in with creative ideas and totally break the mold. And it was awesome. Like Anne Hanley wanted to do a fireside chat. So we literally sat by our fireplaces and had a chat. Um, Brian Fanzo used, I think it's called Prezi Live or Prezi, it's Prezi Live, um, to put his slides, so to speak, his content kind of transparent on his actual screen next to his face. That was really cool. Um, but then at the same time, we had just as many people who said, okay, not a sales pitch. Uh, I'm just going to record like a webinar. And they had slides. Some didn't even have slides. They had their video up in the corner. And we actually had one uh, person that we asked to redo it because they opened with, hi, everyone. I'm here recording my recording for the Digital Sales and Marketing Day event. So we're going to talk about this topic. And I was like, that is the least exciting introduction I've ever seen. <laughs> um, so we actually pushed back on a couple people and had them redo it. And it was worth it. Um, but I think next time, now we know the guidance we need to give. Specifically, we had some people recording in Zoom. We had some people recording in Vidyard. Some people using um, Wistia Soapbox. And it having a variety of different formats was not a problem at all. What we didn't say was make sure that your video is big enough for people to see you and make sure that it doesn't cover up the content on your slides. In a lot of cases, it would have been really helpful. And I did do this for a couple people like uh, for Franco's session to have a co-host. For some people, they just play really well off a co-host. Um, the entire actually invited six of us in to be the live studio audience just to have that energy there. And then for Franco, I recorded for him um, on Zoom, I actually muted myself and hid my video. And I recorded a 50-50 split screen of his slides and his video. So he still ran the slides and presented just like he would. But instead of having that floating video off to the side, we had that 50-50 split. So that was really wow. nice. Yeah. Um, Cloda dragged hers off screen, which helped a lot. Um, just diving into like what Zoom offers when you actually optimize your screen for sharing versus recording. Um, I know we had one person who actually didn't put their slides in presentation mode. They just went through them in Google Slides down the line. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, Megan on our team who was able to edit some white over that to make it look like they were in presentation mode. But things you don't think you have to remind people of, it's like, if you want slides in presentation mode, a 50-50 split with video, you have to say those things. <laughs> So beyond just the execution of this, Stephanie, there was a lot of video promotion that went into getting the word out that we were changing from an in-person event to a virtual. There was things that went out before and after to follow up with attendees. What were some of your biggest takeaways as far as the strategy around promoting the event? Was there, um, was there any of the selling seven that we used specifically to promote it? Oh, good question. Um, we did have speakers that we, we asked to have them do a video for us to promote it. Um, a couple did. It was such a short timeline and a quick turnaround for everything that we know we didn't even do half the promotion we would like to have done. But at the same time, um, we it was such a unique time that getting registrants for this event was actually pretty easy. Um, far too easy to the point where we've created a, a problem where th people think we can do this this easily all the time. Um, and that's not the case. Uh, so we actually need to do much more promotion for the next event and use more video. Um, I do think that Marcus recorded a video for us when we made the switch from the in-person to the virtual event. And it was really, really helpful because if we had just put it, put it in written content in an email and on our website, like most people did, it can come off a little insensitive. And being that it's at this crazy time in the world, um, everyone was still, I think, reeling from the shock of shelter in place and the quarantine. I mean, at this point, like Chicago, I live in Chicago, we weren't even under the shelter in place order yet. So everyone was pretty shocked. And to have Marcus's face and tone and just really feel the empathy from him in the video was a completely different 
way of sharing that message than just putting a banner across our site that said the event's been rescheduled. And I think if we hadn't had that video, we would have lost out on a lot of empathy on that. And then in our virtual event, Bob and I did a session on how we did our virtual event. And one of the things we talk about is the fact that we made money on this event. We sold tickets because we were originally doing a three-day in-person event that people had paid to come to. And that content was still all of very high value. And we also knew that people were a lot less likely to come if they just signed up for yet another free virtual event. But if we're going to ask people to pay money for something, we need to show that we're empathetic to their situation, but also show that we know what we have has value. And so video was a big part of that. And being able to put our tone of voice and our face behind it really mattered specifically because of the state of the world. But now it's going to matter in a lot of other ways. What all have has the team been doing with all of this video content that we now have? Like, How are we repurposing it and getting yeah. more traction with it? So the first thing that we did was we put all the recordings in Impact Plus, which is our online learning community. And um, I know, Mariah, you've been working really hard on that. It was really great to be able to say to all our attendees, uh, the recordings are available, whether you want to relive it or you missed it or you weren't able to hang out for the whole day, you can go right in here. And there's not just recordings, but there's also this community of people. Um, that was really great. We have a partnership with our friends at Quick, Q-U-I-C-C, and they actually gave us uh, free captions for all of our sessions for Digital Sales and Marketing Day. So I'm still going through and capturing, captioning the like 28 sessions I think that we had. Um, we can do about one a day. <laughs> they, it auto captures that I'm just touching it up and making sure that they're perfect. But it's going to be really great to get those captions in there. That's the next thing that I'm doing. Um, this was in part a teaser for the type of content that Impact shares at our events, be it future virtual events, workshops, or hopefully someday again, our in-person conference. And so in one sense, this event was a teaser for that, but also we'll be able to keep repurposing this content in that way to promote future virtual events. Uh, we also, the video is a big part of it, but the conversation that was happening alongside of it was so cool. We have so many screenshots of great comments from people, things that they were enjoying. And so we have uh, kind of little testimonials, I guess you could say, uh, from the people who are in the chat. But I think it's going to be really cool to combine clips from these videos to promote our future virtual events and to actually show people that it's not just another webinar. Uh, that's my goal. Let's say I am a marketing manager and I'm hearing the stuff and I heard you fire all the shots at traditional webinars. <laughs> And I'm going, well, you know, there's the chances of me pulling off a full day event is just not reasonable, but I'm hearing you that I need to step up my webinar game. If I wanted a quick, uh, easy to set up webinar platform where I can run pre-recorded sessions and allow people to chat and follow up with them later, what are some tools that I could look at to make that happen? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, doing a virtual event does not have to be a full day. It could be an afternoon. It could be a morning, it could be a lunch and learn, um, just longer than a 45 minute webinar. Uh, if you wanted to step up your game in that sense, um, Big Marker is a great tool. They offer a lower cost version of what we did. Um, we also, I've seen people do great things with Zoom for the actual presentation and then using Slack for the chat. Um, Slack's really cool in terms of community chat because you can have it running for your community and you can create a specific channel for your one webinar topic or your one virtual event or lunch and learn topic, people can jump in there to chat and then they can leave the channel when the event is over if they don't want to keep discussing, but stay in the community. Um, they can also connect with other attendees if they have a question really, really easily. There's free versions of Slack up to a certain point. Um, there are challenges there having two windows open, having Slack app or Slack in your browser open. Um, I would also be aware of your audience and their technical uh, capabilities, I guess, <laughs> um, their technical comfort. If Slack is something really common, I mean, I'm on 11 Slack teams. It's no big deal for me to join another one. For some people, they've never used Slack. They've never even heard of it. Um, there are other platforms out there. There's so many depending on your needs. And I can link you guys to that same spreadsheet that I have uh, from the community. But 
I was I was really impressed with Big Marker and what we had. My goal, I, I'm talking to uh, my friend Haya, who's working on a tool called Conf, K-O-N-F. And I really want to find the tool, I haven't actually found it yet, that creates the virtual version of the hallway. Because I hear so many people say, oh, I, I loved it, but I miss that in-person event connections that I get to make in the hallway and we're walking to the sessions and we chat in the hallway. I want like a sidebar along all the content just called the hallway. I want people to be able to chat in it. And like, if you can click someone and say, break off and have a discussion with them. Um, I haven't found it yet, but I'll let you know if I do. Steph, you are a gangster. We are so <laughs> happy to have you on the show today and we're happy to work alongside you. Um, if anybody has any questions for Steph, we'll link up some of her uh, contact information. Just don't overwhelm her because she's in high demand right now. Do not. <laughs> she also advised us on, she advised our senior consultants on how to offer a very high-end virtual event consulting product offering. So if you're hearing all this and you're going, wow, I would love to do a DSMD at my organization, but we want to do it right. We can help you with that. We'll link up everything in the show notes. If you want to talk to one of us about how to make that happen. We love you. We cherish the time we get to spend with you every single week. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure you like this video, comment down below if you have any questions or thoughts and make sure you tune in next week for a brand new episode of the film school for marketers podcast until next time. Keep learning. <laughs>